allow me to to begin by thanking the Lord our God for such a day that he has prepared. We are not talking about you. We are not discussing about your successes and the failures. We are presenting to you an amazing God. What an amazing God. When we look at him, what we get is beyond description. The gospel does not start by your need for God. No. The gospel does not start with sinner's need for God. It's important, but that is not what the gospel begins with. The gospel begins with the revelation of who God is. That is why um, in this small book entitled Steps to Christ, uh, it, was first, uh, it was written by um, uh, one of the Adventist pioneers, and I believe, I don't know what others feel, I believe that lady was inspired. She is called Ellen, Ellen G. White. She, she wrote that book, and it was first published in 1892 by, by a company in England, I think it was called Fleming, Fleming Rentville, I can't remember well. They're the first, the ones who published that book. And then uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church bought the copyright, I think in 1892, the same year. And then... Uh, after we bought the copyright, Stanbra Press requested in 1893 to include a chapter that was not there. So they included the first chapter, the one we have, is called God's Love. Otherwise, the book was starting with sinner's need for Christ. So in 1896, uh, Review and the Herald published the book. So today, when you look at that book, it starts with God's love and then sinner's need. And that's the best. They're right. Always don't look at yourself. You start by looking at him. That's why Martin Luther made that great statement. He said, when I look at myself, I don't see how I can ever be saved. All I see is failure of promises, failure in intention. I don't see how I can ever be saved. But then he made a statement, but when I look at Christ, hey, I don't see how I can ever be lost. That's what Martin Luther made that statement. So I'm bringing you to look at what an amazing God is, what, how amazing our God is. And uh, I want you to know that the attention of the whole universe is not you. The attention of the whole universe when you read Revelation is on Christ. I know you, you are jealousy, but that's the way it is. The attention of the whole universe is focused on Christ. And it's when we focus on him, on who he is, on what he has done, that we have no any other confession but one confession, not I, but Christ. And looking at him does not come with academic credentials. It comes by divine revelation. 
I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that Christ did not come to our planet. He did not come to advise us. Advice is good. He did not even come so that we may be good people. Merely good parents, good wives, <laughs> good husbands. There have been many good people, even outside the Christian church, that have been there. Christ came for something higher than that. I would also add and say, he did not come so that we may go to heaven. According to Revelation, heaven is a transit point. Revelation says we shall be there for 1,000 years. And then after that, we shall move. Yes, he died so that we may inherit the new heavens and the new earth. Can somebody say amen? amen? And not just inherit in the normal way, but so that what he has made us in Christ will be in a tangible form an exhibit, an exhibit of his power. So that we shall look as he is. The gospel tells us that he not only saved us, he not only ransomed this world, but he also exalted it. So it is higher than anything else. And I want to bring to you that what God has done emanates from what he is. I want you to look at at uh, Romans chapter 5. Now, um, the reason why I'm taking Romans is because it is, uh, it was, our key text came from uh, chapter 5. And uh, by the way, I want to let you know that there is no greater letter that Paul wrote that clearly gives the revelation of God than Paul's letter to the Romans. People have described it as the clearest epistle that presents the gospel in a very clear way. And I want to suggest that you make it your most loved book. You will never, you can never boast to know Daniel and Revelation if your understanding of Romans is fake. When you read Romans, especially chapter 5, please, I want you to look at verse 1. Paul is giving the privilege, the blessings of having been justified by faith. Please look at verse 1. Therefore, I'm reading from King James Version. Therefore, being justified by faith. Now, please, Paul never wrote it exactly like that because that statement seems to indicate that you are still in the process of being justified. He never wrote like that. The best translation from the Greek is not being justified. It is since now we have been justified by faith. We are not in the process. Since now we have become God's children. That's why when you look at the other translation, it says since now that we have been justified by faith. Now that's a reality. That's what he's saying. The following are our blessings. Number one, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen? Not we can have it. 
not we might have it. He says we already have peace with God. And the peace with God is always vertical. Paul says we have peace with God. Please don't confuse peace with God and your peace with your neighbor or your spouse or whatever it is. Peace with fellow human being is always horizontal. Peace with God is vertical. If you find peace with a fellow human being uh, weak, it's more likely that our appreciation of peace with God is wanting. So he says the first blessing that comes with us, to us, is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that comes to a believer. And I want to speak to somebody somewhere that until you grasp that peace with God, you will never be settled. When Christ left this planet about 2,000 years ago, the only tablet that he gave to his disciples was the word peace. I leave it with you. So Paul says the first blessings that we have is peace with God, not as a result of our performance, but because of what Christ has done. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will show how this peace has come. Then he says that's not the only blessing. Look at verse 2. By whom also. So it means an additional thing. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So what he's saying is we not only have peace with God, but we stand in his grace. We are not firewood for the lake of fire. We are a product of his grace. He says we have, he says in, in, the, in verse 2, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And another additional thing in verse 2, he says we also rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We look forward when what we hold by faith will become a tangible reality. So we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then verse 3, he says, not only so, he adds another blessings. We also glory in tribulation. Hey! That's what he's saying. It's rather a paradox for a person to say, that I glory in tribulation. Tribulation naturally are meant to make us bitter. And there is somebody here listening to me. You can see why you are bitter. You can see why you are unhappy. But Paul seems here to be saying, no, because of who God is. He says here, we rejoice not only the hope of glory, but we also glory in tribulation. Why? Because we know that any suffering we go through worketh patience. Now, the original word is not actually, yeah, patience is a good word, but it's not the best. The best word should be endurance, that we know patience works endurance. And then endurance produces character. And this character here, that's what he keeps on. Please look at your Bible. He says, verse 4, en endure, patience or endurance produces character. And the character, hope. But that hope does not make, make it ashamed. Hope maketh not ashamed. That's how King James Version. 
but it is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given to us. He says we are not just a people who are driven by a philosophy. We are people who are driven by revelation of who God is. He says, I want you to know my people. That's why Paul would say, when I compare the sufferings that we are going through, they are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed for us at the end. A Christian is different. A Christian does not look at the tribulation. He looks at something higher than the tribulation. Because of who, that, who, who we are as a result of what God has done in Christ. We are not crushed by tribulation. We stand strong. I'd be speaking to a mother who is suffering somewhere, to a father who is suffering somewhere, to a young man who is going through tribulation. Do not give up. Look at, the, at what an amazing God that we have. He goes on to say that it's shed in our hearts. God's love is shed in our hearts. That is in verse 5. It's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That means uh, it, is, it is given, it's demonstrated. You know, um, in Matthew 24, the disciples asked Christ a very important question. I think it should be in verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. This was the question. They told him, Lord, they had just taken Christ around the temple and they had shown him how beautiful the temple is. And uh, Christ looked at the architectural design. He looked at the temple and he said, uh, it is not the architectural design that is called the church. It's the people who are there. I wish you brought the people and I displayed them before me. And I said, do you see these single mothers? Do you see these orphans? Do you see these husbands and wives? Do you see these children? This is the church. But Christ said, because your boast is in the architectural design, no stone will be left upon another. And in Matthew 24, verse 3, they came secretly to him and they asked him, one of the questions was, when will these things be? implying the destruction of Jerusalem. Then the second question was very important because they asked him, what shall be the sign of your coming? That's in verse 3. Please remember, the question was, what will be the sign? Don't add S on the sign. If you want to add S, you can do it elsewhere. But when you check, it is singular. In Greek, it's the word Simeon. Don't confuse Simeon with Simeon. It is Simeon in Greek. What will be your Simeon? That's how the disciples asked him. And Christ gave one sign. Simeon in Greek it means a sign given to authenticate or vindicate the one giving it. Simeon means a sign that vindicates the eternal purpose of the one giving it. If you check in Strong's uh, Strong's dictionary, it say, no, I mean in the Greek dictionary, it says it is used a dozen times in the Bible to, to show that which Christ will give, vindicates him, and upholds him. And I want to let you know, war and the rumors of war are important. But Christ warned you, that is not the end. False prophets are important to know, but he warned you, this is not the end. 
it is only one thing that Christ gave in verse 14. He says, and the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in the whole world for a demonstration. Then it will usher in the end. That which ushers in the end is what Christ will do. And it is the preaching of the gospel accompanied by demonstration. And the best place where demonstration of the power of the gospel is done is not on the marketplace. It is not even in a, outside. The best place where it is demonstrated is within the family setting. It is in the family that the children can speak freely and say, my father is really a disciple of Christ. It's when they can say, my mother is really a disciple of Christ. When your son falls, when your daughter gets pregnant, when a child fails, how you react. And I want to let you know that today, the home has become an endangered species. Not only the Christian home is falling apart, no, but the whole nation. Let me tell you, when the, when the home cracks, the church cracks, the nation cracks. But that's not what I'm concerned with. I'm concerned about you. Your identity is destabilized. Do you know that with all that you are, 500 years from now, you will be no better than the street children. Your name, your identity will be gone. Do you know that even all the work that you have done, if the Lord does not bless the children and your genealogy, all that work will be sold at a throwaway price. What I'm talking to is serious. Remember there were people who were ahead of us. They are no longer there. They are gone. We only have 70 years. My brothers and sisters, I'm giving you something to look at which is higher. It's higher because it's God himself. Paul says, he described to us who God is. Look at chapter 5. He says in verse 6, For when we were without strength, hey, in due time, Christ died. Not for the perfect. Look at verse 6 at the end. He died for the ungodly. The other version says, He died for the wicked. When we were without strength, God manifested himself clearly, not after we were baptized, not after we have performed our best, but while we were still sinners. God shines best, not when we, have, we are doing our best, but when we are at our worst. Then we see him in the true color. Allow me to encourage somebody somewhere that the talk in heaven is not how best you are trying. The talk in heaven is how amazing God is. He comes here, he says, he says in verse 8, but God commented his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, hey, Christ died for us. Can you say amen? He says God demonstrated his love towards us. Not when we were, we say, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why is Paul saying this? You know, Paul is speaking this because humanly speaking, <laughs> we always have this impression that uh, 
uh, it is when you are good that the punishment is, is lowered. But when you are bad, the punishment is always tough so that you don't repeat. And sometimes in schools we say, in schools they come and say, um, if you know a lot, your punishment is higher than the one who knows little. Even in church, in some church boards where I come from, if you do something and another person did another thing who has been baptized I, a month ago, your punishment will be more because they will say you know more. So that makes young people say, don't be too much a Christian. Don't go in too much. Because if you make a mistake, you are gone. So they say, I will be very active when I'm about 70. But by the time you reach 70, you have no strength. Paul is saying, who told you that God is less strict when you, are, you, are, you don't know him? But now that you know him, God is so strict that if you do something small, you are gone. So Paul is saying, let me tell you, if he loved us while we were still sinners, don't you think he will love us even more now that we have become his friends? That's what Paul is saying. The power to sustain us, to keep us, is greater than the power that draws us away. You look at your children. Are your children your children because of performance? No, they are not. So why do you change when it comes to God that you are God's children because of performance? You are God's children because of what Christ has done. He bought us by his blood. Look at the children of Israel. The children of Israel were not, uh, were not saved from Egypt, were not removed from Egypt, uh, were not saved from Egypt because they had improved in the character. No. The reason why God did that is because his time had come. When you look at the children of Israel, they were, they were far from being perfect. But God says, I came and I removed you from there. Even the blood that covered them was smeared outside the door. Not, but the people themselves were inside the house. The, those who were inside the house were not perfect. But their hope was in the blood that was sprinkled outside the door. That blood was not for those who are inside to see. No. That blood was for God who said, when I see, I will pass over you. And I want to believe that we are a generation that have been covered by the amazing love of God. Look, look at the next, the next verse. He says in verse 9, much more than being now justified by the blood. Hey, he says, we shall, not we can, not we might, we shall be saved from wrath through him on the judgment day. So we know the outcome of the judgment. Why? Because God's nature does not change. We know. Now that we have become his friends, in the next verse 10 he says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Imagine when we were his enemies. He says much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved. Not by our performance, look at the end of verse 10, but by his life. Can you say amen? That's what he's saying. He says, we know we shall. It is this that, uh, that activates in us a faith that says, for me to live is Christ. And I want to speak to you today 
that your God is an amazing God. I want to inspire you that he changes not. I want to inspire you that he, not, he has not only saved us, but he has exalted us. When you read Ephesians chapter 2, he says in chapter 2, but God, who is great in his love, in his love that he showed us, he has not only forgiven us our sins, but he has also exalted us to sit together with him in the heavenly places. And I want, I liked what this child said. He said that in Christ, we are a new creation. You know, the Bible does not say in Christ we can be. We are a new creation. The word new, I think it's the Greek word kainos. It's not neon. It's, it's neos. It's kainos. Kainos does not mean chronologically new. No. As though this thing is new and the next one is new. No. Kainos means it means that uh, uh, the same thing but qualitatively made new. It's the same one but now made new in quality. So in Christ our status, our destiny has been given a new history. That's why that boy would say, we are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. And I want to inspire this morning that when it comes to saving man, God did something that was never in the mind of any human being, not even the angels. That's why Paul says, it, when he's writing to Corinthians, he tells them what the eye has never seen, what the ear has never heard, what that which has never entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Now, in most cases, <laughs> people think that Paul is speaking about the golden streets because no eye has seen them. They think Paul is speaking about the mansions <laughs> because no eye has seen them. No, no, no. Paul doesn't speak about that. You go to the next verse. The next verse says, but God has revealed them to us. What are those things? Those things are our inheritance in Christ. The, the gospel, the good news, is the birth, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. You can shorten them by saying the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. That is the cornerstones of the gospel. It is what lawyers like calling immortal statements. You cannot change them. Even God himself cannot change them. The birth of Christ, his death, and his resurrection, you can't revise it. They are the pillars of the gospel. You cannot. Do you know if God gave you one billion dollars, it would cost him nothing because he can overturn Mount Kenya and get gold down there and get a trillion. Do you know that when he gave his only unique son, he gave one whom even the father could not replace. He could not do it. When he gave him, giving him was not just a matter of saying, now, goodbye heaven, I'm going. No. 
he gave him to be a member of the human family forever to retain our likeness. That's why Isaiah says, unto us a son is born. Incarnation was irreversible. He became a member of the human family forever. Even resurrection could not erase it. That's why Paul says to the, to the Philippians, Philippians was a small city conquered by the father of Alexander the Great. He gave it his name, Philip. So the people who were there were Philippians. So Paul is writing to the Christians. It was the first uh, a Christian church on the European continent. So he was writing to them It was when he was in jail. He says in chapter 2, I think starting from verse 6, verse 5 he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Or not mind in the sense of the white membrane, no. He's saying, let this uh, attitude, this faith that was in Christ be also in you. How? He says, he who was in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's what he says. He made himself of no reputation. You could not do it. It means by him coming to take humanity, it was part of the mystery that we can't explain. So he made himself of no reputation. He took the likeness of man. He took our nature as low as it had fallen. That's what he's saying. And he says he died, not the death of malaria, but the worst death ever thought of, the death of the cross, which in the Jewish mind meant you are dying without hope of resurrection. He died it. But in Philippians 2, Paul says, but God, amazing as he is, look at what he has done. He raised him up. Not only Christ's resurrection was not a resurrection like that of Lazarus. It was an exaltation. He has raised him up. And not only raised him up, but given him a name above every other name. That name never existed before. That name is not Jesus. It means because of what the Father did, a new existence has been introduced in the Godhead. We never used to have God-man. It has been introduced. That's why W. W. Prescott, he has written an art. He was an education director. And I want to tell all education directors, people will not remember you of how you are running schools. They will remember you of how you lifted up Christ of the pulpit. W.W. Prescott was a general conference education director. He wrote a book entitled Divine Human Family. And almost in the center, he says, because of what Christ did, he has permanently introduced a new form that was never there. God, man. And what has he done? Let me finish here. If you look at yourself, I want to draw three levels. Level one, yes, level one, level two, level three, level four, and so on. I want to imagine, this is my human explanation, it's not perfect. We have the Godhead, the God, div divine. Then we have angels, and then we have man. Man was created th third, lower than angels. And then we have animals. That's why when man falls completely, he, he almost behaves like an animal. Do you know when Christ came, he passed this lab of angels, came to man, redeemed man, and raised him up. Not up to here, but to here. 
That's why Paul says, we are seated together with him in heavenly places. Can you say amen? amen. That's an exaltation that's more than anything else. And that is why when God comes to speak to the husbands, no, I should have corrected it. In the in Ephesians, God is not speaking to husbands. God is commanding the husbands. He says, now, because of who you are, I command you. Akabata is in Greek, it is an imperative. It is love your wives. That's what he's saying. It's not an advice he's saying, can you please love your wife? It's not nothing like that. Even when he speaks to the wives, he doesn't say, can you please submit? The love that the husband is commanded to show, it is called agape. And agape does not expect a payback. Does not say, now I love you, can you submit? There's nothing like that. It's, a, it's an imperative. So God is saying, because of the new creation that I've made, love your wives. And it comes the same thing. It says, wives, love your husbands. No. Uh, uh, submission is not limited to women alone. It's a, a mistranslation. Because in the original manuscript, submission is for both husbands and the wives. Submit to one another. That's how the Greek original manuscripts are. But in our translation, we tend to give impression that it's women, wives to do submission and the men to do loving. That is, that is correct, but it's not accurate. Because when you study it carefully, you discover submissions for both. I'm committing you in the hands of Christ today. A God who is, spe who, who is commanding us when you look at Ephesians, he'll be speaking to husbands and the wives. He'll be speaking to the father and to the mother. He's going to speak to the single parents. He's going to speak to those women that we label numbers. God does not label numbers. You call them second wives, third wives, fourth wives. They are the favorite of God. He's going to speak to orphans. He's going to speak to a barren woman. He's going to speak on our, ch our physically challenged children. He's going to speak on parenting. Not only children, but even parenting our parents in the old age. I'm giving you good news today that he who commands us is the same one who enables us. He empowers us to fulfill the same thing that he commands us to do. And therefore, Paul says, I'm not ashamed in any way. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God and salvation. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, I am determined not to know anything among you. William Buckley says, the reason why Paul says I'm determined only to preach Christ is because he failed when he went to Athens. He used a philosophical approach. Philosophical approach says, uh, I want to explain this unknown God. And as a result, no church ever, there's no epistle called Epistle of the Athenians. So William Buckley says he remembered that failure and he said, I will not repeat that one again. I'm going to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Can you say amen? And as I end, I want to make this statement. There is no family, however limping it may be, that came into existence by accident. Our God is not a God of accidents. Our God is a God of design. And he's telling me, Wamalika, go and tell them not to give up. Because of who I am, 
because of what I've done, I'll make sure that the work that I have begun, I, God, he says, the work that I have begun, I will carry it forward until the day when Christ comes again. That you may know him, that you may rejoice in him, that you may behold him in his beauty is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen to that powerful someone. We'll now rise up for our closing hymn, hymn 108. Father in heaven, what an amazing God you are. As we come to the end of this session, I commit this flock into your hands. 
you know them individually and collectively. I pray, Father, that this week you will manifest yourself to somebody somewhere. I'm praying for a family that is going through a very difficult situation, a family that is almost breaking. Our forefathers told us that you are a God who hears prayer, that you are a God who fights for the weak. I'm praying, Father, that you will visit somebody somewhere this week, praying for the single parents who are here. May you bless their children and make them handkerchiefs to wipe away their tears. I'm praying for widows and widowers who are here. I'm praying for an orphan somewhere. We have been told that you are a God who repairs broken bridges. May this week become a reality. Remember somebody somewhere who is physically challenged. Somebody who is sick in our homes and in our hospitals. You are the great physician. This week, as we mention every member of the family, may you raise our eyes high to see you in the beauty of your nature. May you bless our parents in their old age, but above all, may you open a womb somewhere that's closed. May the, you work a miracle. May we all be able to shout and say, what an amazing God you are. And now as we live to go, May your Holy Spirit take full control, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.